Richard, speaking as an old neurophysiologist, I have been uh, obsessed with the concept of consciousness for virtually my entire life. And what you do is you take the existence of consciousness, which is greatly debatable in today's world, but from that, you have an inference to the existence of God. How do you form your concept of consciousness and how do you make that inference? Yes, let's be clear about the datum first. Um, physics deals with the public world, um, public world of tables and chairs, which it explains in terms of the unobservable public world of atoms and molecules. Uh, but uh, as well as these things in the world, there are thoughts and feelings and purposes and desires and beliefs, and these are the world of consciousness. Uh, these are quite different from the, from the goings on in the brain which cause them. Of course, if I feel pain, it's caused by something happening in my brain, but it's a distinct event from what's happening in my brain. Why do I say that? Well, uh, suppose some creature arrives from Mars looking a bit like us, and it has a central nervous system, so we cut it open and we find in there all sorts of connections between neurons. And uh, so we learn all about its physical nature. But we'd still wonder, does it feel anything if I stick a needle into it? Does it feel anything? And of course, we wouldn't know the answer if it was made slightly differently from us. And that's because um, it's one thing to say what's happening to the neurons or the electro electronic connections. And it's quite a different thing to say what they are connected with in the world of consciousness. And mere knowledge of the one doesn't give you knowledge of the other. So there's different things caused, of course, largely. Our thoughts and feelings are largely caused by goings on in the brain, but they are distinct events from them. And the connection is two-way, that is to say, goings on in the brain cause pains and sometimes thoughts, and uh, my decisions about what to do cause me to do them, which I execute through my limbs. So two-way connections. So there is this whole world of thought, feeling, color, sound, and so on, which is I have privileged access to. It's, to some extent, private to myself. And this is the world of consciousness. Indeed, it's the thing we know about most certainly in the world, that there is this life of consciousness. Uh, we but yet some people say it's an illusion. That is just crazy. <laughs> if you <laughs> say my pain is an illusion, of course it isn't. It's more certain that your pain is there than that the physical world is there because the physical world might be an illusion <laughs> and you could still have pains and thoughts and feelings, but um, you can't be mistaken about whether you do have pains and thoughts and feelings. That's where you start from. That's more certain than anything else. Um, and the next question is, uh, well, are these just sort of properties of my brain, or is there something more to be said about them? I think there is something more to be said about them. That is to say, I think they are properties of me who are an immaterial thing. Uh, uh, the essential me is a soul to whom the purposes, thoughts, feelings, and so on belong, which is in interaction with my body and the primary part of my body, my brain. Why do I say this? Well, um, let's take uh, um, a, a quick thought experiment, uh, which no doubt will be realized one day. Um, suppose some mad surgeon gets hold of me and cuts, uh, cuts open my skull and takes out of it my brain. And my brain is made of two parts, left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And there's largely over some overlap between the two hemispheres in the sense that each of them are to some extent responsible for quite a lot of my thoughts, feelings, and so on. And there's an overlap between the hemispheres so that uh, some of my memories are carried by both hemispheres. And so the uh, surgeon takes out these, uh, my brain divides it into two, and he's got hold of two other victims, and he's taken their uh, brains out of their skull, and he puts the left hemisphere into one of these victims' empty skulls and the right hemisphere into another of these victims' empty skulls. And uh, he takes some further bits from a clone of me and puts them in the other half of the empty skull of these uh, unfortunate victims and starts them up. Now, they, since they have most of my hemispheres, will uh, each of them think, or think it quite likely, that they are the previous Richard Swinburne. 
but of course they can't both be me. Um, on the other hand, there's a good case for supposing that either of them are. Uh, and uh, there are at least three possibilities, either that uh, neither of them are me, or that that one is and that one isn't, or conversely. But my crucial point is, whatever we knew about the neural goings-on, we wouldn't know which is me. Uh, that is to say, whether I have survived this operation is an obvious fact. I mean, either I have or I haven't. Um, but um, uh, the mere knowledge of what has happened to, the, uh, uh, to my brain won't say what has happened to me. And that suggests that me is something other than my brain, because if I am just a matter of my brain and whatever the body is connected with me, you'd know the answer if you knew what had happened to the brain. But you don't know the answer. And it's obviously possible that that one is me. It's behaving like me and so on and so on. But it may not be. And so there's a truth, a further truth. And there can only be a further truth if being me is not a matter of the brain. So thoughts and feelings, etc., belong to the me. Let's call it my soul, the essential part of me. And it's that that's in interaction with my brain. So the datum uh, from which I'm starting my argument is that there is a life of thought and feeling which belongs to an immaterial soul in connection with the body. And, and that's I, in two parts. It's the nature of consciousness itself and then going to the necessity yes. of, a, of a, uh, an immaterial substance, which is you call a soul. So there are two parts of this, yes. and you have that together now in one fact. Now, how do you go from that to the existence of a supreme being? Well, um, as in all of these arguments, the existence of God, um, the phenomena is good evidence for the existence of God if it's such as you would expect if there is a God and you wouldn't expect if there isn't a God. Um, uh, if there is a God, he's, his reason for creating us is going to be connected with our mental life. He's interested in creating beings who have purposes, thoughts, intentions, and uh, can interact with each other and uh, with God himself. He has no particular interest in creating robots, so, so you'd expect this. Um, if there isn't a God, um, would you expect this? Well, not from, uh, not a priori, and not nearly from the, all the laws that govern the physical world. It would have to be something extra, because the laws that govern the physical world tell us how energy is exchanged between bodies, how um, charge is conserved, um, how one fundamental particle gives rise to another. All these are public and physical things. They are not concerned with the, uh, uh, with the production of consciousness. But, you may say, why shouldn't the science of the future incorporate these things? Why, why shouldn't the 22nd century produce a science which incorporates these things? After all, a science has gradually extended its scope. Once upon a time, there was a science, for example, of magnetism, and then a science of electricity, and then a science, they combined them into a science of electromagnetism, and then light was brought into the... Um, picture. There was once a science of light by itself, and then light was seen as an electromagnetic phenomenon. Why shouldn't the physical sciences extend so as to embrace these things? Well, I think there's a good reason why not. If you consider the way science has uh, progressed, and that, uh, let's take the electricity, magnetism, light example, um, when people first dealt with these phenomena, they thought of, say, light as Bright, a bright thing which streamed out from a center and its feature was being bright. And they thought of electricity as something that gave you a tingle <laughs> if you touched it. That is to say, what philosophers call the secondary qualities, color, la, um, color sound, uh, feelings, tingles, belong to the things in the physical world. But the way the physical sciences have progressed, have achieved this unification, is by saying that the color, the sound, etc., doesn't belong to the physical things. It belongs to the effect of the physical things on us. That is to say, things aren't really colored. It's just that rays of a certain wavelength impinge on our eyes and produce the color sensation. And likewise, with light, light isn't really bright. It's just that it's wavelength of a certain sort. Light is really an electromagnetic disturbance. 
Now, what that brings out is that the way the physical sciences have incorporated and have extended is by saying things don't really have these mental characteristics in themselves. They're only the effect of the uh, like, um, electromagnetic waves on us. So it, physics has progressed by saying things aren't the way they appear. They don't really have brightness and sound and so on. All those qualities are just the effect of things on us. And if you say that really light isn't the way it seems, it's an electromagnetic disturbance and colored things aren't really colored, etc., then you can progress. But it's this very progress that makes the last stage of incorporating the conscious life into science <laughs> rules it out. Because uh, you can't incorporate the life of consciousness by ciphering off the consciousness and trying to say it's something else. Uh, you've got to deal with it. And the science has succeeded in expanding by denying that consciousness is part of the phenomenon. And therefore, its very success suggests it will never incorporate <laughs> thoughts, feelings, and so on. So, a priori. So, uh, the very way science has developed suggests that. It can't deal with consciousness, but if there is a God, you would expect it. So that's reason to suppose there's God. Is your argument for God entirely dependent upon that step of creating a soul to explain the consciousness? Or can you go from the consciousness, as we've described it, directly to God without the necessity of having the soul attached to it? Or yes, cause it and to the God? way I describe the second part of the argument, that is so. But my reason for bringing in the soul is that just emphasizes yet further how different uh, the, the world of the, the mental is. Because immaterial things which uh, have uh, feelings and so on are so different from the currency that science, physics has succeeded in explaining the world by that it makes even more this <laughs> difference. Uh, so I mention it only to strengthen the argument.